This is Stone Cold Export and today we are reviewing the ASRock B760 MPG Riptide. So I recently reviewed the B650 MPG Riptide and I was impressed. It was a really good board for a very good price in my opinion. And so when I was looking for a new board for the i5-13600K, uh, I was looking at a couple of options. And one of those options were the C790 MSI Tomahawk. That was initially my first choice, but it was never in stock. And when it was in stock, it was too expensive. And it's just too expensive in my opinion, full stop. Then the other alternatives were the C790 Aorus Elite AX, probably a good board, but uh, also a bit expensive right now. Then we have the ASRock boards and ASRock has a number of interesting uh, boards including the C790 PG Lightning and the PG Riptide uh, and uh, but but I really I thought all the C-series boards were a bit expensive so I took a look at the B-series boards and uh, obviously Intel now allows overclocking on the B-series boards which means you can get a bit more performance even though you can't overclock your CPU. And you might be calling me an idiot for uh, pairing a K-series uh, CPU with a B-series motherboard, but in all honesty, the K-series CPUs are actually, they're pretty quick out of the box. So in the past, uh, I had the 6600K, the i5, and that had a boost clock of, I think, 3.9 gigahertz, and I could overclock it to 4.8, so I could get an extra gigahertz, and that would, was obviously a substantial improvement in performance. Uh, I did test this i5 on a C690 Strix, which is the board I previously had, but I returned because I was not satisfied with it. One of the reasons was that I topped memory out at 6800 megahertz and I just hit a hard wall. Nothing I could do, I could get above 6800. So I returned the board because I was not happy with that. Um, but yeah, I, I did overclock the CPU on that board and I reached 5.3 gigahertz. And that's a 200 gigahertz uh, you know, overclock, which is not going to get you a lot of extra performance, but it is going to get you a lot of extra heat. And that was something I did not want to deal with. So instead, I figured, screw it, and bought a B-series motherboard and just overclocked memory instead. And that's the first thing we are going to talk about, the memory overclocking. So the QVL on this board goes up to 7200 uh, mega transfers or megahertz or whatever. And... Uh, that's interesting because this is a very cheap board with DDR5, which is uh, apparently has support for high-speed DDR5. So I had to test this. Uh, the memory sticks I have are from G-Skill, Trident C5, uh, DDR4, DDR4, DDR5, 6400, and they are Hynix A die. So what I did is I put in the primary timings myself, and then I just let the board figure out figure out all the rest, and uh, I got some interesting results. So first I tried 7200, posted, booted into Windows, no issue whatsoever, ran the IDA stress test, well not the stress test, the benchmark, uh, and it was fine. And I have a screenshot of the timings and results here. Then I tried 7400, no problem at all. 7600, same story, no issues. And 7800, and that also was just fine. Now I'm not saying this that it was stable because I did no stability testing whatsoever but I did just did the benchmark and uh, uh, took a screenshot of the timing so you can see what the board uh, uh, plotted in for itself and uh, I thought that was pretty interesting because this board then achieved a, th uh, a memory speed that was a thousand mega transfer megahertz higher than the C690 Strix board that was much more expensive so clearly these uh, C790 boards are a lot better at memory overclocking compared to the C790. These uh, 700 series boards, uh, B or C series, is apparently uh, uh, cl clearly a lot better at memory overclocking compared to these uh, 600 series boards. Uh, so uh, I did uh, do a stable memory overclock, but I, uh, I, I put the speed down to 7400 uh, because that seemed like a more conservative speed than a higher probability of getting it stable because the thing is uh, you can't control the system agent agent voltage on the b-series boards you might actually not have to uh, but uh, maybe it could be good for stability on very high memory speeds but 7400 at uh, stock uh, sa voltage was just fine uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that you can't uh, control all the timings uh, 
Uh, TXP, for instance, is nowhere to be found in BIOS. At least I could not find it. Uh, and there probably are some others as well that I can't recall at the moment. Uh, but my stable uh, overclock was 7400 MHz and you can see the results and timings here. And I was pretty happy with that. So that's an overclock of a thousand mega transfers or megahertz, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that was impressive. Moving on to the unboxing part and this is a new setup, I hope you like it. In the box there is obviously the manual, you probably don't need it but it could be nice to have. And then there are some SATA cables, those can also come in handy for your hard drives. And then we have a couple of M.2 screws. The board itself obviously comes in an anti-static bag and this time ASRock has opted to not zip tie the board to the foam uh, which I did on the B650, just makes it a bit easier to unbox uh, and uh, well, first impressions are pretty good again build quality is high, uh, equally uh, on par with the B650 model and uh, wh whether or not you are keen on the blue strip on the heatsink, that's up to you. I don't really mind it. It's subtle, so it's okay. And uh, yeah, well, the first impressions here are pretty good. The rear I.O. is also pretty well specced for an M80X board. Um, and uh, yeah, it has most of the features you would need. And we'll get a bit more into that later on. Nice heatsinks for the VRMs. It's also heating for the main M.2 slot. Now let's take a look at the uh, rear I.O. So this board actually offers quite a lot for the money, starting on the all-important rear I.O. Starting at the left-hand side we find two holes for uh, two Wi-Fi antennas, uh, as this board has an M.2 Wi-Fi slot, for, uh, but there's no card included, so you have to get that on your own. Then we have an HDMI port, I have no idea if it's 2 or 2.1, Probably doesn't matter much because you're not going to be using the iGPU. And there's a display port 1.4. Then we have two USB type A ports. Uh, these are USB 2 ports, so fine for keyboard and mice. But anything transferring a, a bit of data will need or will, or will benefit from a faster port. Beneath those uh, we find a PS2 port, which I'm sure is a nice addition for some using old school mechanical keyboards and stuff. And the next to those we have yet another two USB 2 ports. Even though this board is quite cheap, we still get a USB Type-C port. And that's quite nice. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there is a Type-A port above it, and both of those ports are 5 gigabits per second. Next to those we find yet another two USB Type-A ports, also running at 5 gigabits per second. Now, 5 gigabits per second is going to be just fine for the majority of people. The most USB intensive thing I do is transferring video files from an SD card and the SD cards I have top out at about 300 megabytes per second so a 5 gigabit per second port is plenty and you do have some headroom as well. Above the last USB port we find a 2.5 gig LAN port. This port is using the same Dragon RTL 8125BG NIC that the B650MPG Riptide use, uses and we saw with that port that performance was perfectly fine. This port also has the same ALC897 audio codec, uh, but uh, in my test it actually outperformed the B650M uh, model, uh, not by a lot and probably not audible. Well, I couldn't hear a difference anyway. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it's not, again, it's, it's not great, it's okay. And if you want good audio, get the Topping DX2 or some other external solution, because that will be miles above any onboard audio. And in addition to that, you will also keep that for the next motherboard that you buy, so you will have good audio uh, for the foreseeable future. Now let's take a look at the onboard headers. We start off with the all-important fan headers. The B650M PG Riptide had six. This board has one less at five fan headers. The CPU fan header uh, is again only rated for one amp, so don't hook any pumps or very powerful fans to this header. The rest are rated for two amps. This board is also equipped with RGB. It is a bit different compared to the B650 MP Riptide, which had RGB behind the chipset heatsink. Here the RGB is behind the board on the right hand side. I quite like the implementation of this board, but it's personal preference. In addition to the onboard RGB, this board is also equipped with four RGB headers, one regular 12 volt RGB header and three adjustable 5 volt headers. 
I should also mention that Astrock allows you to control this RGB through the BIOS, which is a very nice addition and it's something I hope more companies will do because this means you don't have to install their bloatware. So with the C690 Strix, you had to install Armory Crate. I hate Armory Crate. So you don't actually have to install any bloatware. You can just control it to the BIOS and set it and forget it. And that's a very nice addition. Very good Asrock. Uh, there are three USB headers on this board. Above the right-hand side of the board, we have one USB 3 header and one USB C header. Both are rated for five gigabits per second. In addition, we have one USB 2 header on the bottom of the board. Uh, and so if you have an AIO or an RGB controller that both require the USB 2 header, you either have to only plug in one, use an adapter for the USB 3 header or hook one up to one of the ports on the rear I.O. This board comes equipped with two M.2 slots, both of which are running at PCIe 4.0 by 4, so you are ready for direct storage, uh, assuming you have fast SSDs. There is also M.2 slot for a Wi-Fi card should you wish to add Wi-Fi to the board. The top M.2 slot has a heatsink, and this is one of those just a piece of metal heatsink. It works, but the beefy heatsink on the AMD model kept the SSD 10 degrees cooler when stress testing compared to this one. The main PCIe slot is 16 lanes of PCIe 4.0. There's only one other slot, and that's PCIe 4.0 by 1. This means you can't use a 10 gig NIC. Well, you can, because the slot actually has a cutout on the rear end. But if the card is PCIe 3.0, you are limited to uh, 4 gig, and if you manage to get your hands on a PCIe 4.0 card, that would run at 8 gig. So that's the maximum bandwidth for the slot, not the actual connection speed. In addition to that, if you have a beefy GPU, that GPU will render this slot unusable. Uh, and the PCIe layout here is different compared to the B650M PG Riptide. Uh, so the GPU sits one slot lower, so if you have a tight case, Keep that in mind because it may not fit or it may be so close to the bottom end here that it will be starred for air. So keep that in mind when you're looking for the motherboard and, and the, it obviously depends on what case you're putting this in. So this board also has four SATA connections and that should be plenty. If you need more, you should probably build your own NAS. So to sum up then, this board is an excellent value at the current offer over 120 bucks on Newegg. I think the regular price is 150 and even at that price it's pretty good. At 120 it's unbeatable, at 150 it's uh, it's good, but you should probably also consider the Steel Legend. So the, the benefit of the Steel Legend is that it comes with Wi-Fi, uh, it has 10 gigabits per second ports on the rear I.O. Uh, for USB, so if you need quicker ports you can get that, if you need even faster you have to look somewhere else. Uh, and it has three M.2 slots for storage, and that's very handy because uh, M.2 slots, those are going to be quite nice when we get, we're going forward and direct storage becomes a thing. Because that means that you can upgrade your M.2 SSD and you can still use your old one in another slot if you have three. If you have two, I do feel it's a bit limiting, but it's okay. Two is the minimum, in my opinion. 3 is good, 4 is good, even better. And a word on the VRM. Uh, so I don't do any high-end VRM testing because I don't have any i9 CPUs. But with the i5, the VRM uh, maxed out at 55 degrees Celsius. So perfectly fine, uh, in my opinion. And it will probably handle an i7 and an i9 as well, just fine. But again, I haven't tested that, so don't take my word for it. But yeah, I think it's okay. The Steel Legend has a different VRM. I think it's fewer phases but uh, not sure how the power status compares but uh, even so if you are looking for an M8DX board and you are trying to decide between this one and the Steel Legend if this one is 150 bucks and the Steel Legend is 160 or 170 even consider the Steel Legend because you do get that Wi-Fi uh, and if you need it then uh, I do think it's better to buy the Steel Legend than this board and the Wi-Fi card because that will probably end up to be more expensive. Not quite sure how the memory support is on the Steel Legend, but probably okay as well. 